This is a short revision video on aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We look at the diagrams, what causes the curve to shift, and eventually come on to forming a macroeconomic equilibrium. It's going to be fun! This is your aggregate demand curve, and just like the demand curve you're using in macroeconomics, it slopes downwards. Now, why does it slope downwards? Is the question on all of your minds. Well, when there's lower prices, it's the wealth effect. Consumers buy more at lower prices. They feel better off. They've got lower prices. They can buy more with the same amount of money. When UK prices are lower, exports are quite cheap. You know, in other countries, we can sell more exports. People have more money. Demand increases. It's also lower prices mean that imports are quite expensive. So they look expensive in comparison to UK goods. So demand for a UK goods just increases dramatically. And finally, consumer expectations. When consumers expect the price to rise, so say they're premeditating. Um, inflation, there's increased consumption because they think, oh, I better buy it now before the prices all suddenly shoot up. Hence, when prices are low, people buy stuff because they think, oh, if I don't buy it now, it's going to get more expensive in the future, so more is bought when the price is low. It's really important to get your labels right on the axis. It's price level and real output. You could put a pound and sign instead of price level. Don't just put price because it's the price of all the goods and services in the economy. Moving on to shifts of the AD curve. The AD curve will shift left or right if there's any change to any of the five factors of aggregate demand. That's consumption, investment, government expenditure, and then imports and exports. There are lots of different things that can affect the level of consumption within the economy. We did about them at the end of the last video, but just to go over them, wealth effect, inflation, the rate of interest, and expectations. If you want more detail on any of those, then watch the circular flow of income video. It's just the last few minutes that that will be in. Next, we come on to investment. There are four main things that will affect the amount of investment. That's the rate of interest, business expectations, the rate of technological progress, and the rate of change in income. So the rate of interest affects whether firms save or spend. If there is a low rate of interest, firms think, ah, I may as well spend the money rather than save it. I may as well invest. So investment increases, because if you save the money, you don't get quite as much. Also, when there's a low rate of interest, firms can borrow and so they'll borrow to money to invest because it's cheaper to pay it back. Then we have business expectations. If firms believe that the future is bright, they will invest because they think, oh, we may as well invest you know, more money, more capital equipment even, to produce more in the future so we can meet the high level of demand we're expecting. If they think, oh, the future isn't going to be so good, they won't invest and they'll save because they think, well, there's no point having all this machinery if there's not going to be the demand there to meet it. The rate of technological progress. When our technological progress is greater than that of other countries, we export more, meaning that there's more income in the UK, so consumption rises. But when other countries are doing better on the technological front, then we import more, so demand for UK goods falls. Finally, the rate in the change of income, especially when we're at full capacity. If there is an increase in income, firms think, oh, look, all these people have got more money, so we may as well invest because they're going to be demanding more, they've got higher disposable income, we'll invest so we can produce more to meet their demand. If there's a decrease in national income, then firms will rather save rather than invest. They'll think, oh, there's no point in us investing because there's not going to be the demand there for our goods or services. And this will be spread across the whole economy and all the firms. A really, really, really important term to know here that goes with investment is the accelerator effect. I've mentioned it before, don't get it mixed up with the multiplier effect because they'll always slip in a mixed multiple choice question about accelerator effect and multiple... multiple effect? What the hell? Multiplier effect, so just don't get them mixed up. The accelerator effect is the relationship between the change in new investment and the change of the rate of change of national income. So when national income rises, investment rises. So it's the relationship between any of the components of aggregate demand and investment. Government expenditure is what we're moving on next. This will have an effect on the aggregate demand curve, because obviously government expenditure is one of the five things that make up aggregate demand. The thing that will cause it to shift left is when there's privatisation of government assets. So that's the selling of government assets to the private sector. I can't remember. Maybe I, can't, I always mention the Royal Mail here. I'm not sure if that ever was owned by the government. If it was, and then it was sold to the private sector, that means that the government expenditure is going to be falling because it's going to be spending less, which is a left shift of aggregate demand. On the other hand, an increase in government spending on investment into education, investment to healthcare, anything like that, causes a right shift because the government expenditure rises and consumption will rise as incomes rise. For example, government spending on the public sector, providing lots of jobs, incomes are going to be rising, so consumption will rise, which is another component of aggregate demand, which will cause it to shift right further. Finally, we're moving on to net exports. There are three big things that will have an impact on this, so that's the demand for the exports, the exchange rate, and the UK economy growth. 
If there's no demand for our exports, then that's not good for the AD curve and it'll shift left. That, that might happen if their UK trading partners are in recession, so they're not willing to buy our goods or services. But if they're growing and they want our goods and services, they're buying more and more of them, demand for export is rising, so we will export more, and that'll be a right shift of the aggregate demand curve. The exchange rate, when we've got a strong exchange rate, exports will be expensive and imports will be cheap. So when we've got a strong exchange rate, that'll actually be a left shift of the aggregate demand curve because we will be exporting less because they'll appear expensive to people in other countries and importing more because they'll seem cheap to us. The opposite is true when we've got a weak exchange rate, which will cause there to be a right shift of the aggregate demand curve. Finally, UK economy growth. If we've got high growth, and incomes are increasing, we're actually going to be increasing our imports. We're going to have a higher demand for luxury goods and services from abroad. So that's not going to be so good. That'll be a left shift of the accurate demand curve. However, if we've got negative growth, we will decrease our imports, and that will mean a right shift of the aggregate demand curve. However, when we've got negative growth, we might also be producing less, which means we'll be exporting less as well, and consumption will fall if incomes fall. So negative growth you've got to take into account whether that's going to have a massive impact on the ad curve whether it might actually shift it left but for the basis of being opposite to high growth we'll say it shifts it right but you've got to take all that into account if you're writing an essay on it moving on now to the exciting world of aggregate supply what you can see here is a keynesian aggregate supply diagram you may have been taught it to do it separately so short aggregate supply long aggregate supply and we're going to come on to those in a second but i think that for certain things that you want to show this curve is better but i'll come on to those later basically it slopes upwards because when prices rise firms increase their outputs there's more profit to be made and it also follows the pattern of employment so when there's lots of labor available prices don't increase by very much because i mean firms might be producing more but there's loads of output out there so they'll increase by a bit because they're trying to attract the best people the best workers but it won't increase massively in terms of price level but when the labor market tightens wages are going to rise dramatically because firms are going to have to pay a lot to get the final workers into their companies rather than other companies so that's a massive cost of production so the price level will rise quite dramatically you can see a dramatic rise there and when it gets almost straight that's because the economy has reached full employment so the output cannot change without getting immigration and stuff like that so hence there's a straight line now we're going to split this down into short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply as you can see there's a short run aggregate supply curve there and that assumes that the firm's costs remain the same they don't change as we travel up and down the short run aggregate supply curve if we want to shift the short run aggregate supply curve that's the impact of firm's costs on the amounts being supplied so there are four big factors that increase firm's costs but if you can find any others when you're looking through the uh, context you've been given then use those as well but four big ones are money wage rates the price of raw materials corporation tax and the rate of interest obviously wage rates and raw materials cause costs to rise actual costs to rise if they're there so that's an increase in costs rising so there'll be a left shift and if they fall so money wage rate falls and the price of raw material falls that'll mean costs are falling so firms will be paying less so that'll be a right shift because more firms are able to enter the market we've got corporation tax as well so corporation tax if this increases obviously firms have to pay more left shifts and firms simply aren't going to be able to afford to pay it however if the corporation tax falls it allows more firms to enter the market so that'll be a right shift of the short run aggregate supply curve then we have the rate of interest. If the rate of interest is high, there'll be a left shift of the short and accurate supply curve because borrowing will be more expensive, so firms simply won't be able to afford to borrow to have the right equipment to be able to stay in the market and compete. And also productivity will also fall, which means that average costs will uh, rise, so the price will be more expensive. I mean, it won't necessarily fall, but in comparison to the other firms, it will fall and stuff might get out of date, machines might get a bit crunky or whatever you want to call it. So that means that productivity will fall if the firms aren't working the firms in the, if the machines aren't working as well. Then we have the rate of interest falling. Firms can borrow because uh, borrowing's cheaper, so it's cheaper to pay it back. This means they can invest more in new stuff, which causes productivity to increase, which causes the average costs to fall, so the price will fall so more firms are able to enter the market. 
Moving on now to the lovely LRAS curve. Long and accurate supply is the economy's productive capacity, so its ability to produce goods or services, and it can shift, and we'll come on to that in a second. And that will tend to be shifted by factors that cause the economy's productive capacity to increase, so the economy has the capacity to produce more, literally can, can produce more goods or services. Now, the LRAS potential occurs in the natural rate of unemployment rather than full employment, because when there's full employment... It means everyone in the economy is being employed, and this simply isn't viable. It doesn't happen. It's not logical. So there's always going to be some workers that prefer to stay on benefits. So we have the natural rate of employment, which is the rate of employment that's consistent with a stable rate of inflation. And it's really important to make that distinction. So what causes the LRAS curve to shift? Well, there's a list there. An increase in capital means that a firm, or the whole economy I suppose, has the capacity to produce more, so there's an increased ability for the economy to produce, so there's a right shift of the LRAS curve. Improved technology will shift the curve right, because that means there's increased productivity, so more can be produced with the same resources, so that means there's a right shift of the LRAS curve. When entrepreneurialism is encouraged within the economy, you'll have more ideas coming out, which will lead to more machinery and more increased levels of productivity. So that will be a greater capacity to produce a right shift there. If we've got policies that are encouraging employment, we'll have a increased labour force, so increased production is actually able to take place. So if we've got more people being employed, a greater capacity to produce, so that's a right shift. And increased productivity comes from quite a few of the ones above, and we've already gone through that, but that will always cause there to be a increase in output, and thus a right shift to the LRAS curve. At least if we're putting the same amount in, just we've got a higher productivity. We don't tend to talk about left shifts of the LRAS curve much, but they can shift left, obviously, if our capital and technology falls in quality, will lead to a fall in productivity, that'll be a left shift. If you've got a massive supply-side shock, which we're going to come on to in a second, that causes there to be like a disaster so maybe if we had a oil mine and it blew up so we had no oil i don't know if that can even happen but that would cause that us to have less factors of production we've not got as much in the land section because obviously the resources come under land so we can't produce as much so our capacity to produce has fallen so that's the left shift and also in economies with lots of ill health uh, if you've got a lot of people dying especially from aids or hiv that will be a left shift because you'll have a less capacity to produce because your workers are dead. Macroeconomic equilibrium. We're going to be looking at aggregate demand now. We'll come on to aggregate supply changing later and especially in more detail later as the course progresses. But here we've got the increase in aggregate demand and the decrease in aggregate demand. From AD1 to AD2 you can see there's quite a big rise in output. There's small rise in prices as well but not as much. But from AD2 to AD3 there is a small rise in output and a great rise in prices, so this is very inflationary. Beyond 83, there is no real change in output, but there is a great rise in prices, so there's actual inflation if AD increases beyond the productive capacity of the economy to supply goods and services. When this inflation occurs, we'll be increasing our imports, because A, we'll have the demand there for goods that we can't produce in our own country, and B, our goods will seem more expensive because we have inflation, so we're going to import more, and that will lead to increased balance of payments deficit, which really isn't a very good thing. Then we have our decrease in AD, which is a reduction in aggregate demand. In a negative multiplier effect, this will cause unemployment due to a fall in national income, so well, that will lead to a fall in national income. If the demand isn't there for goods or services, firms are going to have to lay people off, they'll be unemployed, they'll demand less less and less and less so national income will fall people will think oh there's no point in investment investing stuff because there's no market there to sell it to so business expectations are falling leading to fall investment that's a further right shift of aggregate demand and that means that government tax income will fall and because there are more unemployed people so they won't be able to get so much income tax and they'll actually be spending more on benefits expenditure and this could lead to the government getting into a budget deficit, which isn't really a very good thing. So, the SRAS curve and shifting it. it Supply-side shock will cause the SRAS curve to shift. It's something that affects the cost of all firms in the economy. For example, an increase in the price of oil. Pretty much all firms depend on oil for their production. And I don't know why, you know, electricity... Do you get oil, electricity from oil? I'm not sure. But everyone needs oil, really. 
so that'll increase the cost of all the firms in the economy. So a supply side shock, something that's you know, pound. It's really big news. It's not so good. It can cause a massive left shift of the SRAS. And if we've got this left shift, this means that prices will rise. I mean, if you draw it on your diagram, if you drew a cross and you had your um, left shift of the SRAS, you'd see prices be rising due to a contraction of the aggregate demand curve. And that output would also be falling, which isn't really so good because that's negative economic growth. But on the other hand, if we had a right shift, if pr um, the cost of production fell, so firms could produce more, we'll have decreased out prices and increased output. Obviously, low prices are quite good because that leads to people being able to buy more, having a materialistically higher standard of living, stuff like that. Moving on now to the LRES curve, a left shift of the LRES is not very common, but when it happens it leads to a rise in prices and reduced employment. Obviously if we increased our employment then the LRES curve would actually shift right again because we have more productive capacity to produce. There will be inflation because demand will be there for goods that aren't being produced, so there will be excess demand that leads to prices rising. And that means that the economy will be less competitive on an international scale, because if we've got inflation and our output isn't as great as it was, our prices are rising, we can't compete with cheap countries, you know, producing really cheaply and selling our goods to us, so that means we're less internationally competitive. And then we have a right shift of the LRES curve, which leads to a fall in prices, increased employment and a more competitive economy. Obviously, it's you know, sort of the inverse of everything from the left shift of LRS curve, and that's really good, I'd say. Hope that video helped you, and have a lovely day. Good luck in the exam, and see you next time for macroeconomic policy indicators. Woohoo!